Good evening to all the members of the International Law Society, um, as well as the broader followers that we have um, within the academic community. I'm really excited to be discussing um, a matter of international humanitarian law today with Alessandro, who I'll introduce shortly. Um, hi. Um, but I guess the purpose of these conversations we're planning to have is to have a more interactive means of engaging uh, with our audience um, and also provide you an opportunity to um, familiarise yourself with the faces behind a lot of the academic content that we publish um, because we do have a contributor with us today um, who has been published in the Perth International Law Journal. Um, but before I introduce Alessandro and delve into the topic. I'll just quickly introduce myself. I'm Chelsea and I'm on the executive of the International Law Society as well as a current editor of the Perth International Law Journal. And for those who aren't familiar, and I don't want to plug the journal too much, but uh, the Perth International Law Journal is a leading uh, academic journal in Australia. Um, we don't only accept submissions from our state or within the nation, but we are open to international submissions as well. Um, so without more plugging of the Society in Journal, let's introduce the topic. Um, today we will be discussing international humanitarian law um, with a focus on civilians um, in conflict. And what an apt topic for our guest today, who is doing his dissertation on the matter. Um, his article, Direct Participation in Hostilities Between a Rock and a Hard Place, was published in Volume 4 of the Perth International Law Journal. Um, he is a PhD candidate at the University of Western Australia, um, having initially received his undergraduate degree um, in international relations and uh, diplomatic affairs from the University of Bologna and uh, Maastricht University, which I pronounced incorrectly despite practicing, but uh, he also has two master's degrees from UWA, um, which he did prior to commencing his PhD. And aside from his interests and passion uh, for international law and European law, he also has a passion for history. He's an avid reader. He's a dual citizen of Italy and Australia. He's multilingual and he has a personal interest in mental health advocacy. It's such a pleasure to call him a friend and to have a chat with him today. So I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to hand over to Alessandro to introduce yourself um, as well as the research you're currently undertaking. All right. Thank you, Chelsea. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Chelsea, for such a wonderful introduction. And I guess you made me sound like bigger than I actually am. Um, so Hi everyone, my name is Alessandro. I am a PhD candidate at UWA. Uh, my focus, as Chelsea was underlining, is in international humanitarian law, which is, which encompasses the laws of armed conflict. And it is a very important branch of international law, which is also referred to as use ad bello, uh, sorry, use in bello, as opposed to use ad bellum, which if there are any Latinists among us, they will know that use in bello is the law in warfare. So it's kind of a lex specialis, meaning that there are a specific set of laws that apply in situations of conflict, as opposed to, for instance, human rights, which are the laws, the international laws that usually apply in, in situations of non-conflict. Um, I've been at UWA for four years now. It's been a long journey. Um, and I've been very happy of being published on the Perth Journal of International Law. So thank you for that privilege. And... It's, I guess it's a pleasure for me um, to be here and discuss my research. And on another note, you have also been published at another, in another lucrative uh, journal. Do you want to just briefly mention that? Um, so I just got accepted on the uh, Journal of International Humanitarian Legal Studies, which is a major international law, uh, international humanitarian law journal. Um, I'm not sure when uh, the publication will take place, but it's in the editing stage. So hopefully sooner rather than later, I'm going to be able to, you know, give you access to the other article as well. This other one is a bit longer, it's 18,000 words. So it's a bit... Yeah. Um, so I guess, as I mentioned earlier, this discussion is just going to be very introductory. Um, so 
for viewers, uh, viewers probably don't know much about international humanitarian law at all. So on that note, can you please explain to us what IHL is and its main principles, its scope, and what you would deem key issues um, unfolding in that space at the moment? Right. So international humanitarian law, as I was briefly mentioning, it's, it encompasses all the laws that apply in armed conflict. Now, a little bit of history about international humanitarian law. I'm sure a lot of you have heard about the Geneva Convention, Conventions or the additional protocols or the various treaties that have been, especially the, one on, the ones on nuclear weapons. But the truth is, we can trace back the history of uh, international humanitarian law to the 19th century. There was a battle in Italy called the Battle of Solferino, and there was this very rich Swiss businessman named Henri Dunant, who was passing through the area and he realized all the atrocities that were being committed on that battlefield. And when he went back to Geneva, he basically started a movement which ended up being the Red Cross, the International Committee of the Red Cross, which had the purpose of actually creating a legal framework that would uphold principles of humanity and at the same time balance military necessities. So on the one hand, people have realized that war had its inherent purposes, military purposes, which include targeting, targeting is the fancy word for killing people on the battlefield, and at the same time realize that there are some requirements of humanity that must be respected at all times on the battlefield. And starting from this, well, this reflection, we started developing what are now the Geneva Conventions, mm -hmm. and the latest version of the Geneva Conventions were signed in 1949. There were a couple more additional protocols, uh, three more additional protocols, and the main ones, which are the ones that I look at in my research, are uh, the ones published in 19, uh, signed in 1977. And some of the main uh, principles that we can talk about when it comes to international humanitarian law, aside the balance between military necessity and principles of humanity, there is a principle of distinction, which we we'll probably have a chance to look a bit more detail in a few minutes. The principle of distinction basically entails that there are two legal categories on the battlefield, civilians and combatants. Civilians are protected under international humanitarian law, both in international armed conflicts and in non-international armed conflicts. The difference is, an international armed conflict is when we have multiple states fighting each other. A non-international armed conflict is when we have a state fighting against a non-state party, which can be an organized armed group and non-international uh, non conflicts are the most common trend of warfare in modern warfare. Mm -hmm. Now, we have these two categories, combatants and civilians. Civilians cannot be targeted, and again, it goes back to the whole principle of humanity. So civilians have been associated with the moral understanding of innocence, and therefore, people who, have, like, who do not present danger, who are not harmful in conflict, should be spared from the terrors of warfare, the, um, the brutalities and terror warfare. That's, that's how it is usually referred to. On the other hand, combatants, which are you know, state armies or militias, they can be targeted in warfare. There are obviously rules about when and how you can target them, but it is generally accepted that combatants and is legal to target combatants in warfare. And this is the first principle. So you have to distinguish all times between civilians and combatants. Mm -hmm. So we have another very important principle, which is the principle of proportionality. So the principle of proportionality, on the other hand, take, uh, looks at the so-called collateral damage. So for instance, I'm going to give an example which has no right or wrong answer, but it's just an example to make you understand a little bit better how we can apply the principle, the principle of proportionality. So for instance, we have a truck that has on its inside many bombs that will be deployed in the, in the upcoming conflict. This truck is being driven by a civilian. Now, if I am a military officer who is being called to make a judgment 
upon whether to bomb that truck or not, I have to consider whether seizing the content of that truck, destroying the content of that truck with all those bombs can justify the incidental loss of life of the civilian driving the truck. So that's the principle of proportionality, understanding whether the military advantage caused by seizing or destroying a target can justify any collateral damage, of usually civilian life, that comes with it. So there is no right or wrong answer, honestly, because it depends. It's a very much of a case by case. Yeah. Yeah. But it's important to keep that in mind when you make that kind of judgment. Mm -hmm. So this principle of distinction that you mentioned, um, you know, it borders violations when you're addressing these issues of IHL. Can you like flesh that out a bit more? Um, you made a statement on that in your abstract. Um, do you want to delve into that? Sure. Um, truth is, it can be quite easy to understand when I say the principle of distinction because, you know, you can just tell me, well, Alessandro, it's, it's a civilian or a combatant. You can easily recognize them. Like, as a, probably a state military will have a uniform or a civilian will just be anywhere beside a battlefield. However, many of you might be familiar with this, but you might not. Warfare has changed a lot in the last decades. Imagine, for instance, in the Second World War, we used to have these isolated battlefields where the civilians used to be in their big towns, used these big uh, conglomerates of people, whereas the militaries, they would be fighting on isolated battlefields. However, right now, there has been a so-called urbanization of warfare. So warfare, war is usually fought in ur urban settings. And therefore, civilians are now mingled with the themes of warfare. Furthermore, there has been a heavy technologization of warfare, and there are so many equipment that now need civilian contractors to operate them. And on top of all that, it's another example, there are so many I can make, but this is another important example. There are so many private military security companies that are being hired to perform tasks that are usually associated with the military. And therefore, the legal status of these people who are now pretty much entangled with the whole structure of warfare is quite unclear. And this is where the principle of distinction must be upheld, but without proper guidelines, it is very hard to do so. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have the concept of direct participation in hostilities, which is basically the around with. Because that's what? quite a big um, direct participation in hostilities. It's quite a... Um, fleshy topic that we'll discuss more later as we um, progress in this discussion. Um, but I will now direct the discussion to the objective of your research. Um, so as stipulated in your paper, your objective is to provide a snapshot of the sub subject and to inform the reader of both the theoretical and the practical underpinnings of civilian participation in hostilities underlying potential issues and the efforts of inter the international community to address them, most notably the interpretive guidance on the notion of direct participation in hostilities. Um, so can you please explain now what direct participation means uh, for those in our audience? You did mention it and I, I uh, cut you off, so I was directing it here. <laughs> So the fulcrum of my research is the so-called direct participation in hostilities and this takes place in that grey area that I was mentioning where civilians are increasingly taking more military uh, kind of duties on the battlefield and there is a provision which is contained in both additional protocols to the Geneva Conventions. So the first additional protocol is for international armed conflicts and the second is for non-international armed conflicts but they use the same wording. The wording says that civilians are protected in conflict unless and for such time as they take a direct part in hostilities. That's the rule. Mm -hmm. So there are a few questions that arise after reading the, this, this, this provision. And first of all, what is direct participation as opposed to indirect? So I was making the example before when I was trying to explain the principle of proportionality about 
the civilian driving an ammunition, uh, well, a bomb truck, an ammunition truck, whatever it is. So, for instance, let's, if we imagine someone getting a gun and shooting the gun, this is obviously direct participation. But what about driving an ammunition truck? Like, this, there is no right or wrong answer, once again. But Chelsea, do you think that driving an ammunition truck is direct participation or more indirect? I think, again, it's, it's quite discretionary. It depends on the intention of the driver of the truck um, and therefore has to be assessed by a case-by-case -case basis. It's not uh, black and white. Hmm. So, you know, I see your point and it's exactly what I'm trying to actually f uh, argue against in my research for one simple reason. We talk about human lives and we're going to touch about the issue of moral philosophy in a while. But the truth is, when we talk about human lives, I have the feeling that we must account for each human life in a consistent and homogeneous manner. Mm -hmm. And therefore, if there are two conflicts in two separate parts of the world and there are two civilians who don't know each other and they're pretty much doing the same act on the battlefield, I want those two people to be judged in the same, through the same benchmark. I don't want that discretion to be so broad that it just direct participation in OCDs, I'm going to be referring to as DPH, mm. direct participation. Mm. Uh, DPH loses its meaning so that pretty much it's all about how someone sees it rather than following some benchmarks. And when we talk about human lives, we'd like to think that human lives are accounted for in a consistent manner with you know, universally applicable benchmarks and guidelines. And that's what I refer to in my research as homogeneity issues. No, I, um, I have that perspective as an outsider because that's exactly what you were advocating against. And I think you make a very um, potent point. Um, yes. So thank you for explaining that. Um, did you want to add anything to that before I move on? Maybe, sorry. No, <laughs> um, the time in the world. This is the first big point. What is direct participation? The second big point, there are three main points. So this is, I'm going to go with the second. So also understanding when can we stop calling someone a civilian as such before that person becomes a de facto combatant. For instance, we have so many organized and groups where their members, legally speaking, they, have, they, they still retain their legal label as civilians but they perform on a daily basis duties that are most commonly associated with combatants. But in non-international armed conflicts, there is no combatant label for people who do not belong to state armies. And this is a big question. Mm -hmm. And I believe that warfare has evolved so much that we now need to start thinking about changing labels or at least broadening up what is the scope of combatants, especially in non-international armed conflicts, which I repeat, is now the most common trend of modern warfare. And the third biggest question that arises with DPH is the first part, which says, unless and for such time as. So this means that a civilian can regain protection as soon as he or she finishes his or her participation in hostilities. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Like, when, when do we set the boundaries? When can we say that DPH is starting and when can we say DPH is ending? And there have been so, many, so much criticism over the last few years, I would say, and they call this, this phenomenon as the revolving door phenomenon, you know, like the revolving door. So basically, a lot of experts have been criticizing the idea that civilians who are, you know, always so, like, so very involved in the dynamics of warfare, enter and exit the, um, the principle of distinction uh, revolving door so that they can seek shelter while they're not attacking, but then lose the protection only when they're attacking. So it's, it's quite contentious um, issue. And the best, the most famous, okay, maybe not best, most famous attempt of the international community to tackle the issue is the so-called guidance, interpretive guidance on the notion of direct participation in hostilities that was published by the Red Cross in 2009. While personally, I appreciate the immense work that came behind it, and it was the first international attempt to create some guidelines in order to frame the issue of direct participation in cities. I 
personally and so many other experts have found so many flaws in that attempt and in my research while i do highly regard the the guidance and i do use it as starting points for so many of my arguments i still believe that there's so much more that has to be done mm -hmm. Yeah, great. That's a great segue to what I was going to ask you next. Um, so your paper argued that the literature available on the subject in IHL uh, does little, if anything, to solve the problem at hand. So why do you think this is the case and what remedy do you provide? Um, namely, what novel solution would you like to bring right. to this field? Thank you for that, because this is a big, big question. So. I'm not trying to minimize the importance of finding a problem because in research, even finding an issue is a great achievement. And I'm not here to minimize the works of my colleagues or any of the people who came before me because it is important sometimes to notice that there is a problem before we can start at building some bricks in order to frame the question under different circumstances or spotlights. But the truth is, most of the academic work that is available on the MENA just keeps on criticizing the interpretation of direct participation of CDTs or goes on to stress out the fact that it is very hard to, uh, to put it in practice. Because in theory, when I tell you that someone is directly participating in CDTs, you would think, fair enough, like the, the, closer, the closer a behavior resembles a, like a combatant's action, the more it's going to be direct participation on CDs, which is fair enough. But the truth is, there are so many challenges that come now with modern technologies, such as cyber warfare. Cyber warfare, this is not something that we were used to 34 years ago. There was no internet. Um, so the truth is, how are we going to approach, for instance, the physicality of a behavior? So if we see someone firing a gun, well, that is quite easy to assess. On the other hand, Someone who's hacking a server that contains so many important, I don't know, data sets on, uh, on, one, on one state, on one's army, it is still like a highly dangerous, um, highly, uh, highly harmful action to perform. And we have no idea how to tackle this issue. We have no idea if that's DPH or not. So is physicality I'm like a criterion to be considered. All these kind of things, like people keep on criticizing, but don't, they don't really dwell on how we can solve those issues. Yes. And one, mm -hmm. I'm not protecting mm -hmm. all the sure. answers. In Critiques without practical okay. remedies. And I'm not, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna pretend to stand here and knowing all the answers in the world. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna fix the whole thing. Warfare is going to be fixed. I'm going to fix everything. No, of course not. I can't, I can't do that. But the truth is, I have this different mindset from many of the works that have been published before me, which is a bit more practical, trying to understand if we can reconcile theory and practice, understanding that every decision we make and every single word that I write could be implemented on the battlefield. And even if it's going to be a guidance 2.0, meaning that many academics will probably criticize my words, I don't know, maybe. But the truth is, I'm hoping to channel the attention towards a more practical understanding of the issue. And if it works out, well, I'm gonna be more than glad that that happens. <laughs> no, that sounds very pragmatic and effective. You know, we need to have practical um, impacts in the work we undertake. So I, mean, I think you put it very well. Um, so to move on and to more address the moral and ethical, I guess, side of things, um, deciding who lives and who dies is a contentious consideration um, and something that arguably transcends the boundaries of international humanitarian law. So how do you reconcile the legal requirements of DPH and the moral or ethical circumstances that surround the concept of life and death? Right. Thank you for that question. Uh, this is obviously something that goes at the core of moral philosophy. Even before we can talk about international humanitarian law, it is also important to talk about human life. So I've already said that international humanitarian law is born as a compromise between humanity and military necessities. However, when you want to enforce that balance, you still need to think 
they were talking about human lives. And even if I'm just running on a laptop, just kilometers, kilometers away from a conflict, I need to bear in mind that certain decisions that I make, certain ass like assessments that I make could mean that one day someone is going to you know, live or die because of my words. And there are consequences in everything that we do and have. And that has brought me close to arguments of more philosophy, understanding the meaning of human life, and especially the classic questions of good and evil. So when we talk about evil, for instance, and we know that someone is going to place a bomb, which is going to kill, I don't know, a hundred people, which is going to be very unfortunate. I'm sorry to bring up these serious examples, but this is something that in my field, we end up discussing quite a lot and quite often. So you're in a position to trade, and that's a trolley problem in moral philosophy. You have to decide whether you can accept the death of one person who is arguably evil. Who is um, just very quickly, could you ex sort of share your own personal moral philosophy with the audience? Like, are you a utilitarian? So they sort of understand the perspective that you're coming from. Right. So I, I started my academic career as a deontologist, meaning that it's all about the intention. But I've slowly shifted towards a more utilitarianist approach. And that has also been informed by some personal growth, I guess, over the years, not just academic, but also personal. And I started realizing that it's how you, it's the actions that you, you know, put out in the world on a daily basis that can allow us to understand whether or not we can use the label of good or evil. But just to finish that example I was making, we have this one person who might implant a bomb that will explode and um, and 100 people will go down with it. So in my position, you probably have to argue that it is good to remove that one person before 100 people are dead. But at the same time, you are arguing about targeting one person, even if that person can arguably be labeled as under evil. Mm -hmm. Now, the whole question of good and evil, as we well discussed before, is a pretty tricky one. And there are so many reflections that we can make on it. The truth is, I want to ask you, since you asked my opinion, do you think we should employ a more deontological or utilitarianist approach when we account for human lives? Again, on matters of ethics, it's inevitably subjective and... Um, there's always going to be contention. I do think for this scenario, a utilitarian perspective would appear more feasible simply due to the fact that you were minimising um, damage on yeah. a large sum of people as opposed to a smaller sum of people. And of course, um, conflicts with the issue of the value of human life, which you pointed out, because a death is ultimately a death, and um, we're still impinging on the right to someone's life by selecting to take their lives over um, the lives of another group of people. So I am quite utilitarian on this matter. Um, for the purposes of our audience, I think it's irrelevant, but I do think moral and ethical considerations are irrelevant. Because um, we can't practice law devoid of moral and ethical considerations. Um, and the truth is, questions can get much more messier when we start thinking about grey areas of example. So someone planting a bomb, that is quite easy according to, you know, centuries of moral philosophy. Nietzsche would say that we're wrong. But beside Nietzsche, uh, we will probably say that according to our moral compass, we will easily label that person as evil. On the other hand, when we are talking about cyber warfare and someone launching like a virus that will delete, I don't know, the hospital records where the leader of some army is recovering from an injury. So that means that person might die as a result of that. But it's a much more tricky, it's a much trickier situation to to assess, like, is this person who's launching a virus just from a keyboard evil? Like, can we actually make that person fall under the umbrella of evil? Do we have alternatives in that? 
because we're still talking about human lives. At the end of the day, we're still talking about people who might have families, who might depend on other people. And even if some cases are much more clear cut than others, the bomb in place, huh? there are others that, you know, make, vex me a lot. I'm not going to lie. There are times when I'm like, you see, like logically what I'm saying makes sense, but morally I feel, I feel like a hard burden on me. I don't know if I'm explaining it correctly. If you get what I'm trying to That criminality does not automatically convey an evil act. Right. And that's like the positivist notion of law. Um, so a particular act can be worthy of a criminal charge, even if the general population, like a broad generalisation, uh, doesn't agree that that particular act, act is necessarily evil. Um, anyway, I'm going off on a tangent, but uh, you did. On the other hand, like combatants, like the legally, um, the only cat category which you can legally target under international humanitarian law, they can all be targeted at all times unless they are, that's a French expression, hors de combat, which means outside of combat. But the truth is, even a cook that belongs to a state military can be targeted. On the other hand, we can easily conclude that a cook, just in a, any normal setting from the civilian world, should not be targeted because a cook, that's for sure not direct participation in hostilities. So at the same time, there have been so many experts, usually coming from the state side, that probably even rightfully say, look, in that case, why should they not be targeted if a cook in the military should be targeted, can be targeted? To which I, will, I might reply, maybe it's better not to target any of the cooks. But these are things that obviously go and stretch a little bit. What, is, what are the legal considerations made by international humanitarian law? And again, warfare is changing. We can't imagine modern warfare the same way we used to imagine it 100 years ago, which is fine. It's just that we just need to be aware that these changes need to be addressed also on a legal level. And these legal considerations must come from moral considerations as well. And as you touched on earlier, the best way is to create appropriate standards and benchmarks um, because they'll never be abided to perfectly, but at least you know you have a framework to follow that is possibly most feasible and ethical because um, both principles have to be considered. Um, you know, fantastic. I think we are running out of time. so. Is there anything else you would like to add before I conclude and finally plug the channel? Um. <laughs> I just want to thank you for this opportunity. It's always a pleasure. You know, <laughs> you know that. Um, I just want to say hi to everyone. Thank oh. you for following. Alessandro is a really friendly guy, so do say hello to him if you see him around campus. Maybe <laughs> meet him at the tab for a drink. I don't know. Um, yeah, or, yeah, yeah, I, I, I <laughs> you aren't in the law very much but um do say hi and on that note i will conclude um by thanking those who have taken time to watch this discussion as well as reminding um, those with a proclivity for research a passion for international law those who have innovative ideas pertaining to contemporary developments in international law to please uh, send through your articles to the Perth Arnold J at shootingmail.com um, and we will consider publishing you in the upcoming volume of the journal volume four um, and yes that's about it so thank you so much for your time Alessandro see you later thank you Bye.